Good morning. It sure is nice to be with you. Today we're going to talk about one of the more interesting characters in the Old Testament. We're going to talk about Hannah. Now, about 10, 12 years ago, the founder of the show 60 Minutes, Don Hewitt, passed away. And in the retrospective about his life, there was one thing that stood out to me. He said, I don't care so much about issues as I care about how people face those issues. I'm interested in stories about people facing issues. I thought a lot about that because that's how I approach the Bible and teaching. I'm not as much interested in abstract issues, theoretical questions, even theology until it is applied to our lives. It's not that those things are unimportant. It's just that my theology needs some flesh and bones on it. And Hannah gives us some flesh and some bones. Give me a story about someone facing a hard problem. See how she or he encounters God in that problem. And I'll pay attention because then the Bible comes alive for me. And that brings me to the story today, the story about Hannah, who is facing an issue, childlessness. 1 Samuel 1 through 8. Join with me as I read. There was a certain man from Ramathim, a Zufite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jehoam, the son of Elu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. Now, if you can get through that, we've, we've achieved a lot right there. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Penina. Penina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophim and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the, of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Elkanah, her husband, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? When we open the book of Samuel, things are looking pretty bad. Israel's in crisis. There are enemies all around. The Philistines are threatening. The leaders are corrupt. The priests are corrupt. The priests' children are corrupt. It's not a good time and no one's sure exactly how God is going to deliver them. And yet the story of God's solution to this problem doesn't start with national or world pro pro politics, the religious hierarchy or military strategy. It begins with the story of a woman, a woman whose crisis is very similar to the crisis of Israel. It begins with Hannah. Like Israel, Hannah's in a bad way. She was powerless to change her circumstance, and she was in pain, and no one understood. And a world where having children, especially sons, was a sign of God's favor and of security, Hannah was a loser. Yes, her husband loved her, he even gave her twice as much meat as he gave her rival. This is the equivalent of going to the jewelry store and getting her really special jewelry and not giving any to the, to the sister wife. And when Hannah cried, he tried to comfort her. 
Aren't I enough for you, dear wife? Aren't I more to you than ten sons? Note to Elkanah. It might have been more effective if he had said, You are enough for me. You are better than ten sons. Elkanah, it's not about you. Hannah's days are difficult as her rival Penina and Penina's brood torments her. Yes, Hannah's tents were peaceful and quiet. She had uninterrupted time to work on her projects, her needlework, whatever. She had leisure, and in that leisure, she could overhear the noise of the many sons and daughters of Penina just across the camp, and she wanted something different. She wanted to be run off her feet chasing little ones and supervising big ones. She would gladly have changed places with Penina. She wanted Elkanah, her husband, sure, but she also wanted children. Infertility is one of the most painful experiences that one can endure, but is only one example of many t issues of frustration, of emptiness and agony that we privately encounter. What do you say when others think that what you have should be enough, but it's not enough? What do you do when they ask you, what more do you want? You have a beautiful home, a fantastic career, a loving spouse, maybe an, even an SUV full of children who are all, of course, above average. And yet, life isn't quite enough. There's something missing. And the world tells you, you should be satisfied. You should sit down, like Hannah, and be content. But Hannah wasn't content. In this passage, we see Hannah at the point where there's no human help available, no emotional support, and whose fault was the whole thing? Amazingly, it was God's fault. And the scripture tells us that very clearly. It says twice, the Lord closed her womb. This was God's doing. And if there are no second causes, if it's God's choice to close her womb, we have to wrestle with the fact that God planned that this woman would suffer. That's kind of hard to take because it makes us think, well, this thing didn't just slip by God. He made it happen. God directly planned that she would have no children, that she would therefore suffer in this way. I can't tell you why God closed Hannah's womb any more than I can tell you why things happen to you that are painful. But I can tell you in this instance, in this story, at this moment, we can see that Hannah recognized she had no power and no, no ability to change her own circumstance. Maybe in our lives, times of powerlessness, financial strength, family relationships, things aren't going the way we wanted. Our life isn't going the way we planned. Our health isn't what it should be. And we can't change it. Maybe in those times, that's when God can reach out and be real to us. Maybe when we can't handle our challenges, when we can no longer handle them, that's time when we know God's power. When do we call on God? If you're like me, it's when you're desperate, when you're at the end of your rope. And it's at the end of our ropes that we find the Lord. It's at the end of our ropes that we lean into him, let him catch us, hold us, and raise us to a higher place. And I believe God brought Hannah to this place in the dark history of Israel so that God could show that he was indeed going to rescue not only this woman, but his people when they were at the end of their ropes. So year after year, Hannah, Elkanah, and his two wives traveled up to Shiloh, which is where they worshiped at the time. And Shiloh 
Shiloh, the very name means tranquility and peace. But Hannah had no peace. Hannah had no tranquility in Shiloh. Instead, she sat down at a, with a feast before her, crying, until one year something changed. First Samuel 1, 9 through 20. Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on a chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. And she made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you only look upon your servant's misery and remember her, I'd not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart. Her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and he said to her, How long will you keep on getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I've been praying out here, here out of my anguish and grief. Go in peace, Eli said. And may the God of Israel grant you what you've asked for him. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. And then she went on her way and ate something and her face was no longer downcast. One year, it was simply too much for Hannah. Hannah rose. She got up. What made that year different from all the rest? Maybe she was just tired, exhausted of trying to be content, of trying to guard her heart against Penina's taunts, tired of no one understanding her and believing that even God did not care. Maybe she just thought, what have I to lose? When the feasting and drinking were over and the rest of Elkina's clan returned to their tents, sated and content, the sounds of the camp grew fainter. The adults and the children went to sleep. They turned in for the night. Hannah said, this is it. And she rose and she went to the Lord's temple and she poured out her heart on the very porch of the temple to the Lord. She approached God's temple and went to the place where she could go, even though she wasn't a priest, even though she wasn't a mother, even though she was merely a woman, and a woman who God had apparently turned his back on. In fact, she might have thought God only cared about the big picture. He only cared about the tribes, the promised land, the leaders of her, of her country. He had enough on his plate but she rose anyway, and she went and she prayed and she brought her small life before the Lord. She rose and silently went to the very porch of the temple to pray in bitterness of spirit and soul. Her prayers were straight from her heart. They were not edited. They were whispered from her, her lips so that only God could hear. She wasn't trying to impress anybody with pious phrases or her deep spirituality or the right of her argument. She just brought her cares to the Lord. And as she did, she even cried so much that Eli, the priest, who was sitting in the shadow of the doorpost so she did not see him, thought she was probably a drunkard. She'd been drinking too much. And he chastised her. Amazing that Eli would choose to chastise her. Eli, who could not keep his own house in order. And yet he says, why are you drinking? Stop drinking. Oh, she rose. She went to pray. She endured judgment. And in the face of that judgment, she says, not so, my Lord. I am a woman who's troubled, pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take me for a wicked woman. I've been praying here out of great anguish and grief. Verse 
So how does Eli respond? Does he say, well, let's sit down and talk about your problem? No. He acknowledges that she's not at peace. He says simply go in peace and may the God of Israel grant you what you've asked of him. That was enough. Finally, someone acknowledged that she wasn't at peace and that God was the source of her peace. Not her husband, not her possessions, not even her standing in the community, but God. Hannah went on her way. She ate something. Her face was no longer downcast. And the change happened immediately. Not her conception, but her face was no longer downcast. She was no longer in despair because she knew that God would hear. And he did. You see, Hannah's life was changed when she rose. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 19, the next morning, they, being the whole camp of Hannah and her husband and, and her rival, rose, worshipped before the Lord, and went back to their home at Ramah. And Elkanah lay with Hannah, his wife, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. And then we read that Hannah stayed behind when Elkanah went up to offer sacrifices to the Lord until the time when she could fulfill her promise to God when the son was weaned and nursed for, away from him. That would probably be about four or five years old in those days. At that point, she went to Eli and said, As sure as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here before you praying to the Lord. I prayed for this child. The Lord has granted me what I asked for him. And now I give this child to the Lord for his whole life. He will be given over to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there, meaning Samuel. Samuel, the very famous Samuel, who will have such an instrumental role in leading Israel out of bondage, out of fear to the Philistines, who will anoint the first king, King Saul, and then later, David. <clears throat> Hannah prays in chapter 2, and it's a beautiful prayer. I encourage you to read the whole of it again, to read how God brings fullness to those who are hungry, who God gives children to the barren, who God makes alive those who've brought down to the dead and exalts those who are in poverty and seats them with princes. I wish, like, wish I could just read the whole thing to you, but I don't have time now. So read it because this is critical. Because Hannah in her faith rose and Hannah in her faith, instead of sitting and fasting and fearful and taking abuse, rose and came to God. She found out that God is a God who knows. God is a God who hears. God is a God who does not discount your pain. And God knows what you're going through. This is also a God who raises. He doesn't just know, but he lifts up. He lifts up. He lifts the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap, and he seats them among princes or princesses, and he gives them a throne of honor. You may think that God, like everyone around you, doesn't want to hear from you. You may think that you should just be content, quiet, and resigned to your life, despite what pain you go through. You may think, like Hannah might may have early on, that life will never change for you, that you should squelch the stirring in your heart for intimacy with God and with others, for meaning in your life, and yet God knows, God hears. And it is the knowledge that he hears that gives us hope. Hannah rose, taking the bold step of approaching a God whom she feared would not listen. She, though she 
had a blessing, a promise pronounced by Eli, and that's all she had was ignited with a spark of faith. She went back, sat down, and ate, no longer in despair, and lifted up her face. She was now a woman who God valued, not through the granting of children, but through knowing and hearing her. The change began when she believed that God heard. And her faith was confirmed months later when she could see Bora's son and saw him safely through infancy. She knew that when she rose, she rose in the power of God, the one who lifted up the poor and the needy and gave them an inherited throne. When we rise to approach God in honesty and in need, God raises us up us up to an inheritance we didn't earn. Paupers become princesses. When we approach God with a deep awareness of our need, a need that surpasses what those around us say we should think is sufficient for happiness. When we come in honesty and surrender to God, we can achieve that inheritance. We receive it because our standing is as God's children. And he knows, he hears, and he wishes to act. He's waiting for us to rise. Tonight, you, today, you may be feeling like Hannah, unsatisfied, despairing, and alone. That's good. You're feeling that. It's your motivation because Penina, the self con- self-satisfied, contented wife, she wasn't the one that rose and came to the Lord. Only the one that recognized her need, Hannah, rose and came to God. There are lots of us who think we have it all together, or at least want the world to think we have it all together. Those like Penina, managing to make meaning and find purpose in our life on our own. And in our midst, there are Hannahs. They are the, tru- they are the truly blessed ones because the Hannahs will rise with empty arms, dare to approach God and say, I need you. Will you, like Hannah, boldly rise with empty hands and approach God who wants to give you everything you desire and need? Amen. Thank you.